Uh, if you can't find your seats, we got a wonderful service for us uh, this morning. We got about five baptisms. Um, yes. Bless the Lord. The Lord is working. And uh, Pastor Mike just shared this. That is 12 baptisms in the last 30 days. So we are seeing God move. Um, we're excited about that, and we're excited to praise Him because He is moving in our midst. We are also going to have an opportunity, if you feel like you're being left out, um, please uh, know that we're going to have a worship night in um, a couple weeks, and that's going to be in your bulletin. We're going to have baptisms there. We're going to have rededications there. And then we're also going to, because uh, we're inspired by Jesus Revolution at Pirates Cove, there's going to be baptisms there as well. And so um, if you want to participate in seeing what the Lord is doing, please do so. We're going to um, praise the Lord this morning for the work that he's doing, for he is worthy of all our praise. Would you please pray with me as we begin? Heavenly Father, again, thank you so much that we have an opportunity to just praise you for what you're doing in our midst. Lord, we acknowledge and celebrate with the heavens as you have declared when one individual professes their faith in you, the heavens celebrate. So we have much to be thankful for and much to praise you. And so, Heavenly Father, we give your spirit permission to work in our lives today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand and sing. Let's sing this out together. Praise God from who all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above you, heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Through every storm, your 
will be faithful forevermore. You have done great things, and I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. Oh God, you do great things. Oh hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Sing hallelujah. And hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. great things. Sing hallelujah. And hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. Oh, you have done great another in the fire standing next to me there was another in the waters holding back the seas and should i ever need reminding of how i've been set free there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me there is another in the fire left for death beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore and should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning either way I won't bow to the things of this world and I know I will never be alone there was another in the fire standing next to me there was another in the waters 
holding back the seas and should i ever need reminding what power set me free there is a grave that holds no body and now the power that lives in me there is another in the fire is another in the fire oh there is another in the fire oh there is another in the fire oh and i can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him i can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where's then i can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in nothing stands between us nothing stands between the name that is Jesus. Amen. He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come on may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. Yes, I know I will never be alone. There'll be another in the fire standing next to me. There'll be another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding, how good you've been to me? I count the joy come every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. See the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him. I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where's then. I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between us. There'll be another in the fire. Standing next to me, there'll be another in the waters, holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding, how good you've been to me? I count the joy come every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. I count the joy come every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. Count the joy come every battle, cause I know that's where you'll be. Amen.
into the midst of the sea and through it all through it all my eyes are on you and through it all through it all it is well us in any kind of situation God and Lord we seek you and we seek your wisdom God and that we could not only mentally feel God but we could physically feel that it is well with our soul God because when we have you everything is well God so be with us today Lord Jesus and we love you so much in Jesus name amen why don't you turn around and say good morning to somebody Is this one? Oh, yes, this one's on. Oh, good. Yay! Hello! Hello! 
Good morning. Good morning. Hola, como estas? Good morning. Hello. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Good morning. Good morning. We have something exciting to start off our morning. Woo! I can't wait. Where is Pastor John? There he is. I can give it back to you. But, um, just before we get to into baptisms, as we're getting uh, started with baptisms, if you can make your seats. One of the things I just wanted to talk about and what baptism actually is, it's uh, publicly identifying with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in his death, burial, and resurrection. And it's publicly declaring, hey, this is who I believe in and want to identify it. But also, there's another aspect. I was talking to Rachel, and this was actually Rachel's idea. And I was like, man, you're brilliant, so I'm going to share it and take credit for it. Um, one of the things when it comes to even just rededications, and we, we're going to see a little bit of individuals want to rededicate their lives through the act of baptism as well. And if anyone has been to a, a wedding renewal of vows, you know how special that is when a couple quote unquote renews those vows because they mean something a little bit different than they did when the first time they made them. And it doesn't mean that first time they made them that it didn't count, they didn't know, but all of a sudden with experience, it means something a little bit deeper. And that's when we um, have individuals do a rededication or a renewal of their faith. We see individuals saying, hey, I want to quote unquote let people know, I, I know what it means to walk with Jesus a little bit deeper than I did the first time, but I'm going to continue to, to walk that path. And so that's what's special about rededications and renewals. And I just wanted to highlight that and share that. And again, I want to take credit because that was all Rachel's idea. Um, but uh, yes, um, and so we're going to have some baptisms. We're going to celebrate that. And here we go. Introduce yourself to everybody. My, my name is June. I'm nine years old and I'm in third grade. <laughs> and I'm June's dad. So Yay. she's one of my little arrows. So the Bible, you know, uh, compares our children to being like arrows in the hands of a warrior. So I get to baptize one of my little arrows today and wow. hopefully send her off right in the right direction. So, June, um, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. No. Um, have you. Uh, is it your desire this morning to follow him in the act of baptism? Yes. And with the Holy Spirit's help, will you do your best to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. And I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Good morning. Good morning. My name's Corey, and this I have the privilege today of baptizing my three daughters. This one's Aubrey Bishop. Hello, Aubrey. Aubrey. Would you like to say anything? Um, I'm thankful that my family started coming here, and I look forward to getting closer to God. Okay. All right, Aubrey. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. Is it your desire to follow him in baptism this morning? With the Holy Spirit's help, do you promise to follow Jesus in all the days of your life? I now baptize you in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> this is my oldest daughter, Paisley. Paisley, do you want to say anything? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. Jeremiah 29, 11. Amen. All right, Paisley, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. 
Is it your desire this morning to follow Jesus in baptism? Yes. With the, with the Holy Spirit's help, <laughs> uh, do you promise to do your best to follow Jesus in all the days of your life? Yes. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes. Yes. Is it your desire to follow Jesus in baptism this morning? Yes. Yes. With the Holy Spirit's help, do you promise to do your best to follow Jesus in all of the days of your life? Yes. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Steve, and this is my daughter, Novali, and what a privilege it is to uh, baptize my daughter, and my first baptism, too. Um, Novali, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Do you promise to um, follow Jesus Christ and obey and trust and to get to know him? Yes. Then I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> Is this on? There we go. Oh, I got goosebumps. That's so exciting. I love it. I love it. I don't know about you guys, but I'm a firm believer in um, it takes a village. So I kind of think of these kids as my kids, our kids. And um, gosh, what a blessing it is to see them get baptized. I love it. I love it. All right. Um, so all month we've been talking about forgiveness. Today, um, I have a question for you. Have any of you ever broken something accidentally, of course? I know you wouldn't do it on purpose because you're fantastic kids. Have you ever broken something that belonged to somebody else? My brother did. A little. A little. Oopsie. Anybody else, Chevelle? Yes. I forgot. Okay. Yes, she remembers breaking it. She just doesn't remember what it is. That's okay. Well, what uh, the whoever's thing it was, what happened? Did they get mad, or did they yell at you, or did they say that's okay? A little bit sad. A little bit sad. But did they forgive you? Good. Forgiveness is important. Um, and then what would happen if somebody broke something that you had that was special to you? How do you think you might react? I felt bad. You would feel bad, yeah. Would any of you get mad? I would feel mad but forgive them. Ah, oh, that's awesome. How about you? My brother broke my doll once and I forgive him. Oh, oh, this one right here. <laughs> it's okay. You know what? I broke my bro when I was little, I broke my brother's bowl. He got like this ceramic bowl and I broke it like right after he got it. Luckily, he forgave me. Well, today we're going to be talking about a guy in the Bible who um got forgiven, but then when he was supposed to forgive somebody else, he didn't. Wah, wah, wah. We're going to see what happens. We're going to find out what happens when we go over. All right? Who wants to pray? <gasps> Brianna. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for a day today that no one gets sick or hurt, and I pray for this weekend that, or week that we can all have a great week. 
and I pray for everybody who is sick that they would feel better. Better in Jesus' name, pray. Amen. Amen. These are exciting times, aren't they? Yes, they are. <clears throat> As they're leaving, we have some uh, birthdays to celebrate. We celebrate right here, don't we? Yes, we do. Yes. Don Mester's having a birthday. Ben Waldrop's having a birthday. Justin Wall's having a birthday. Yeah. Ex ex <laughs> you have a one-person cheerleader up here. Her pom-poms are going. Yes. <laughs> That's exciting. We have several announcements, uh, the first of which uh, fits in with what you just were able to witness. Uh, there's a place called Pirate's Cove, um, and on the 30th of April, we're going to have beach baptisms, and you are all invited to do that. And I know John mentioned rededication and being baptized again. Just let us know that you want to. If you don't make up your mind until you get there and you want to, that's okay also. Um, we, we are just going to have a time of celebration. Uh, for some of us who were around when the Jesus Revolution was going on, uh, we remember what it was like down there. And there is nothing like watching God's Spirit fill people and have them dance for joy once they've entered the waters of, of baptism. It is amazing. So you're going to want to come to witness even if you don't desire to be baptized uh, on the 30th. Uh, we have some other announcements going on. There's a women's retreat, com retreat coming up May 5th through the 7th. If you want to go to that, um, then you can see uh, uh, Judy. And I think Judy is going to come up and say something. Are you going to say anything, Judy? Okay, the, okay, well, actually, there's a few ladies that want to challenge you to attend. Come on, ladies. Good morning, and ladies, we just wanted to let you know, and hopefully that most of you sign up, or all of you, for the women's retreat coming up. It's on uh, May 5th to the 7th. It's wonderful. There's a $50 deposit so that we can get our cabin saved. And um, last year was my first year. I was very hesitant at going because I'd never done it before. But I almost backed out at the last minute, and I was so glad I didn't. We have such a great time. And just real quick before I let Lois talk, I wanted to say, remember the young, the junior, or the youth when they went? And none of them were here the net on Sunday because they were coming home from the retreat. I think on that Sunday, no, no women should be here. We should all be at the retreat and just let the men have the service. <laughs> Um, we, they have great food there. Uh, we have good fellowship. It's a really a good way to get to know other women in the church. And um, we really hope you'll join us this year. Oh, you got here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I was hiding. I don't know. Uh, we, the, it was so, in, we've been to many retreats. But the one on the mountain is so special because you're on the mountain. You get up in the morning and you say, where should I be, Lord? what should I be doing, Lord? And Lord, he talks to you the whole time you're there. And not only with the music, with your fellow sisters, uh, fellow sisters, yeah. but with your sisters. <laughs> and it, the, it, it's just fantastic. It's, it's like having a camp out or something like that. That's, you, you just get up in the morning, you're just talking and you're being silly. You're eating too much. Yeah. You, you, get to do, you get to dance when you can't dance. You sing very loudly when you can't sing, but it works so well. <laughs> Thank you. So on that Sunday, I guess we're going to have no ladies here, <laughs> if, if you get your wish. Uh, but I, I know uh, Judy and Lois have shared, they desire the same enthusiasm the youth came back with for the women to come back with. So if you want to be a part of that, then please talk with them afterwards. And don't let finances be a reason not to go. And I mean that seriously. We have people who will pay a scholarship for you to be able to go. If you have the time and the inclination and God's calling you to go, then please don't miss it. Um, on the 26th, which is next week, we're going to have an information meeting. Uh, we do that uh, semi-annually as a way of just letting you know the great things that God's doing around here. Uh, it's, it's not a business meeting, although I think we're going to have a, a vote to extend the term of a couple of the elders because they've reached the limit. But outside of that, it's a way for us to let you know that in all areas, the youth, which you've been visibly uh, able to see, the children's ministry, what's going on financially, all of that, just a time for us to give you information. It will be put on video. So if you can't be here next week after the service, it'll be on video and we'll send out next week a link so you can go and take a look at it that way because we want everybody to be informed. There's no secrets around here. Anything you want to ask, you're more than um, welcome to ask any given week. Uh, let's see. Also, on the 23rd, 
a lot of announcements. On the 23rd, we have another worship night. And uh, if you missed the last one, you're going to want to be here for this one. It was amazing, amazing. And uh, if you... Uh, uh, if you get a chance to go see the movie, and by the way, there's a bunch of us that are going today at 4.30, the 4.30 showing at Dos Lagos. Uh, you can go online, get a ticket, and meet us there. We're going to have a fun, fun time just being with each other and watching some history replay itself. So with all of that, um, we, uh, every week, we dedicate a period of our time to demonstrating that God's first in our lives. And we do that through our tithes and offerings. And we're going to receive those now. Would you please bow with me as we pray and get ready to receive them? Father, we give you praise. We thank you. It is because of you that we gather together. It is in your name. Father, we know that the world has absolutely no authority or ability to invade us when we are close to you. And we pray, Father, in all areas of our lives, including our finances, that we will dedicate them to you, knowing that all of it comes from you anyway. I pray for those who give today that you will bless them, Father, abundantly from your abundance, not what they imagine to be abundance, but from your abundance. And Father, we pray as that happens, we get to see the world recognize that, yes, there's something different about us. We have your light inside of us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are um, going to be starting a sermon series on Moses. And what we're going to do is just take up uh, kind of scenes of Moses' life. Um, one of the things that I think it's beneficial for us to recognize that God and he brought Moses um, from a simple, humble beginning and used him greatly. And a lot of times we think, oh, that's awesome for Moses because Moses was Moses. If we would think about it, we all grew up with the movie Charlton Heston and you're like, he's Moses. Big old beard, booming voice. We're like, yeah, of course God can use someone like Moses, right? But Moses had some insecurities. Moses fell short on a couple of areas. And um, as we go through, we're going to see the human aspect of Moses, but also God's relationship with him. And so um, we're just going to take some highlights and just really focus on God uh, um, using Moses and how he uh, really led his people and the people he was surrounded with. And so um, we're going to take a look at that in a couple weeks sermon series. And so that's what I'm doing um, this morning is we're going to just kind of lay the foundation for that sermon series. And I think we're going to be blessed by it. So would you please pray with me as we begin? Uh, Heavenly Father, again, thank you so much for another opportunity to share your word. Lord, we just ask your Holy Spirit, again, to give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you're going to tell us this morning. Father, we're thankful for Moses. We're thankful for you. And Lord, we just ask a special blessing on this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, if you have, raise your hand if you actually used to read comic books. Okay, cool. I thank you guys for that. Um, raise your hand if you guys watch movies. <laughs> All right, now let's see if we can get this because there's one character that um, is pretty famous. I don't know if you guys know, any of you guys know uh, Superman? Oh, you guys all chuckle. Good, you guys got that one right. Yeah, that one kind of crossed a generational boundaries. Yeah, so in the early 30s, what happened, there was a, um, two individuals who were looking uh, at a way and looking at the way of the time. It's probably in the late 30s. Um, so World War II is kind of going on, and they're seeing their people kind of um, being uh, systematically eliminated. And there was a lot of persecution for their people. And in this um, task that they were given, they were given to write a comic strip, and they were given an opportunity to say, what kind of hero do we want this person to be? And so they decided to look at their own um, religious background and the hero in which they decided to model after Moses was Superman. And so two Jewish authors actually brought in together. And if you look at the similarities between Superman's birth and Moses are very similar. So if you remember Krypton, if you remember how Jesus, uh, Jesus, Moses, um, he, Superman turns into Jesus later, just so you know. Um, that's how it works. And, and, and seriously, he morphed into Super Jesus. Um, but originally, how it started is in Krypton, the planets, there's persecution. And then his, his mother and father put him in a basket because it was hostile to where he was at. And they ship him off to another area. And all of a sudden, he is raised by people that aren't his parents. And he's sent there to be a deliverer for that people. 
And it's interesting that we see that now, right? Had no idea. I remember being a comic book nerd and I heard that. I was like, huh? What? That's awesome. I'm like, Super Moses. And then he becomes, like I said, it's Super Jesus now. If you see it, it's Super Jesus. He's a Christological fair, uh, character now, if you've seen, seen it now. And so it's kind of morphed into that. But that's what these two individuals use. And even in his S, his, his name in Krypton, Kyle, is a derivative of God's voice in Hebrew. And so they were intentional about this character. And so for some of us who have um, heard the music, wonderful melody of Hakuna Matata, what a wonderful phrase, Hakuna Matata, right? Some of you know the rest of the lyrics, but I'm not going to sing it because I'm offbeat. Um, thank you, you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> right? So Lion King, right? We all seen Lion King, and guess what? Just like they had inspiration from Superman, they also have inspiration in that to where their leader who is part of the royal family is now exiled and then returns to his proper family to redeem and to restore it just like Mufasa had him and Simba here he is so you see these themes and it was interesting when I learned it because I was watching a, a documentary of or the behind the scenes of Lion King. And when that brought up, I was like, I never saw that before. That was new for me. I was like, I can't believe these, these popular culture were pulling themes from the Bible. And we forget Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. So Moses has a theme that he wants us to see in the book of Genesis. And he has a theme that he wants us to see. It was like, hey, this is how God interacts with his people. And if we remember the garden scene, that God created the heavens and the earth. And what kind of God do you think Moses wants to tell and his people to be reminded of while they are traveling in the desert for 40 plus years? A very powerful God. Not only one God, but the God who is the creator of the universe. Right? Right? And so Moses is telling his people, is like, guess what? This is the God you worship. And you might not be thinking that because you're in the desert where it's hot. Right? You're not going to be thinking that because you're kind of grumpy. Because you don't have a lot of food that you used to eat. Right? So Moses is wanting his people to focus on the God of the universe and he builds and he paints the wonderful tapestry of the first creation, the first week. And he's saying, this is the God we worship. And then all of a sudden he created you in his image. We have a function now. And he says that and he goes, Adam and Eve. And then he gives them a responsibility and he points them back. And here are the themes of that. How long did that last in the garden for them? right? Not very long. There's not a full scene of the garden. What we see is the fall to where people now create a will that is just like God's, but all of a sudden that will now is telling themselves, we get to do what we want, right? It's not that bad living apart from God, doing what we want to do. And then you see the fall just Take a nosedive. But did God, did God give up on his creation? The answer is no. When they messed up, you're going to see that theme over and over in Genesis. And that's what Moses is writing, that God didn't give up on his people when they messed up. Over and over, you see it. This is Moses writing Telling his people who are going to be reading it because some of them aren't getting into the promised land. And he wants them to know, but God didn't give up on you. He's still present with you. Even though you don't get to enter in the promised land, he's there. He loves you. And guess what? I'm part of that too. If you guys remember, Moses didn't enter in the promised land. And we're going to talk about how and why that happened. But here, Moses is setting the tapestry of the God of the universe and you have themes you have themes that he's pointing to where people are continually rejecting the way they've been designed to live and wanting to live on their own way 
And they said, oh, my way is better than your way. And you see it. You see it with Noah. You see it with the Tower of Babel. And then all of a sudden we have Abraham. And Abraham is the perfect family, right? He was a perfect example. He never lied. Right? Twice. That guy, she's, she's not my wife. That's my sister. Right? And so we see how God selects Abraham and through his family. And we see all of a sudden why Abraham is hailed as the father of Abraham. He's the father of our faith because of what he does, his belief in the God of the universe. That something might happen as he lays his only son on the altar to where we know as parents that if the Lord asked me in a certain time, I would have no problem putting my kid on that altar. <laughs> They're like, if you call me right now, not a problem, Lord. <laughs> right? But this was his only son, miracle son. And you guys know a miraculous birth that was in that story. And he lays him on the altar. He pulls the knife out. And in the Mediterranean culture, you know when you pull that knife out, you're intended to use it. It doesn't go back in the sheath. It goes to be used. God sees that. He goes, hold that. Stop. Here we go. Lamb right here. Pull Isaac off. Isaac's like, thank you. Awesome. Right? Lamb goes on the sacrificial lamb. He goes, I know that you love the God of miracles more than that miracle. Okay, let me say that again. That you love the God of miracles more than that miracle. And that was the point of Abraham. And you're going to see that over and over with the nation of Israel. Do they love the God of the miracle versus the miracle in itself? And that's where true transformation comes, is your belief in the God of the miracle, not the miracle itself. Because that's where you see all of a sudden how they ended up in Egypt. How they ended up in Egypt. For you see from Abraham and his family, and if you remember their great-great-grandsons, Joseph walking around with a little cool coat, and he had some brothers who were a little bit jealous, and they're like, why is this one super special, right? Showing favoritism, and then all of a sudden we're like, we know, send that kid away. His brothers literally sell him into slavery. His brothers acting like the first brothers... That we read about in Genesis, Cain and Abel. Yep. Do you guys remember that? Yep. And so there's themes going on. It's like, that's not how a family is supposed to behave. They're not supposed to be fighting with one another. They're supposed to be protecting and loving one another. And yet you see what happens with Cain and Abel. One kills another. And then you see it at the very end of Genesis to where one brother looks at another and is jealous. We're like, get him out of here. Let's tell dad he was eaten alive. And you're seeing the nation of Israel not behaving the way they're supposed to. But God takes what they intended for evil and he takes it for good. And you see the archetype of the Messiah in Joseph. You see the archetype of what Joseph is. And he endures suffering after suffering after suffering. He tells the truth and it ends up and puts him in jail for it. When it would have been easier for him to compromise morally. And he was firm in his faith and his conviction to his God. In the midst of where this God placed him in a place that he didn't want to be. He didn't want to be home. He didn't want to be in a foreign land. And yet, from Potiphar's wife, he tells him no, and he goes into jail, and he's like, I don't want to be in jail. And all of a sudden, he's interpreting dreams for people there. And then God moves in his life to where those people they interpreted dreams for ends up in front of Pharaoh. Pharaoh has some dreams. He's like, hey, I know a guy. I know a guy that might help us. So Joseph comes in before and he goes into the Pharaoh and all of a sudden now Joseph is placed in some authority positions and he's like there's famine in the area and his family 
that sold him into slavery come on in front of him. And he goes, I recognize these guys. And with the full weight of authority, I don't know about you, but I'd be like, ha, ha, ha. I've been planning this for so long. But you guys are going to be humiliated. You're going to be in jail. I've been in jail myself. It's a bummer. It's not even fun. It's your turn. Right? No, Joseph weeps. He wants to know, are they changed? He wants to know, can they be redeemed? And he does. And his family comes. And then their entire family comes out of the land in which God has promised to them. So it's over there. They're in Egypt. And now all of a sudden, the Egyptians rise. They rise. And now we get to hear Moses' story. So he's pointing at those themes. He understands the God that we have. And here we have in Exodus chapter 2, he says, The man of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and born son. And when she saw him, he was beautiful. She hid him for three months. But she could not hide him no longer. She got him in a wicker basket and covered it with tar and a pitch and then put the child into it. And sitting among the reeds by the bank of the Nile, his sister stood at a distance to find what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile, and her maidens were walking alongside the Nile, and she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid, and she brought it to her, and she opened it. She saw a child, and behold, the boy was crying. And she had pity on him and said, This is the one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to the Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse? For you, for the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for you. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go ahead. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and the nurse for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew and was brought to Pharaoh's daughter and she became her son. And she named him Moses and said, because I drew him out of the water. Now it came about those days when Moses had grown up and they went out to his brethren and looked on their hard labors. And he saw the Egyptian beating a Hebrew and one of his brethren. So he looked away and that way. And when he saw that there was no one around, he struck the Egyptian and he hid him in the sand. And so you see, this is where Moses, this is life. And so one of the things I want you to be aware of this in this setting is that you have Moses living in essentially two worlds, okay? Moses essentially living in two worlds. And there's a theme about that because Jesus and Moses are going to be inverted. Jesus left his world and came down. Moses was essentially, his world was the world of the slaves. Because at the time to where Egypt and Israel they didn't have the same connection that they did in Joseph's time. Because the Pharaoh and the Pharaoh, they're like, hey, um, I don't know these people. I don't know how they got here. And all of a sudden, they're expanding and they feel threatened. And so now persecution starts to happen on the nation of Israel. And to where so much so that they said no more children can be born, especially males. They're supposed to be eliminated. And so there was great fear for young couples. What happens if we have a family? Do we not get to have a family anymore? And then all of a sudden one does. She cannot hide that son anymore. Real danger. So where they place her in a basket and hoping mercy comes. We've seen that same kind of setting with Jesus. Same kind of setting to where Jesus happens to where there is a decree by one of the leaders is saying, no more. If you have a child, must be eliminated. So much so that Jesus' mother had to flee the area and have the child in return. Right? Do we see the similarities but where Jesus essentially leaves his position Moses is elevated from his. So Moses is living in two worlds. So he's a part of the Hebrew family, being raised by his Hebrew mom. 
and exposed to their culture, exposed to their gods. And he's also in a dual world to where he's exposed to Egypt's gods. He's exposed to this kind of palace life to where he's experiencing not the same thing his culture and his people are. Moses is essentially living the best life possible. He's in the king's palace, the pharaoh's palace. He's being trained, he's being educated while his people are being pressed upon, persecuted. And so you see this happening. And so what I want you to know is this. He says that some of you might feel like you've had to live in two different worlds. And God understands that. God understands that because some of us understand what it's like to have to live in two separate homes. Being gone through a divorce. And you're one way at at this school and you're another way at this house. You're another way over here. And you can go, man, that's tough. That's hard. That's hard because I'm supposed to be this way with this group of people. And I'm supposed to be this way with this group of people. And guess what? God can identify with that too when he sent his son Jesus. For you see, Jesus had the same things. Can you imagine what was being said about Moses when he was walking? Oh, hey, he's one of us, but he's not really. Right? He's one of us, but not really because he doesn't have the same struggles we have. He gets to live in that palace. But we all can see he has the same physical characteristics as us. We all know the quote-unquote true story of his father, and it's not Pharaoh, right? So when someone says the same very thing about Jesus and about his father, for when Jesus was speaking in a town, one of the towns he grew up in the area, and he started proclaiming the gospel that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, And then all of a sudden he's doing miracles, but then one of the critics goes, oh yeah, by the way, isn't he a son? Uh, Isn't he is the son of a carpenter? Isn't he a son of a carpenter? Wink, wink. Okay, now let me explain that because to Jesus, about Jesus at that point. Because when they're saying, hey, by the way, isn't his dad a carpenter? Wink, wink. What they're really saying is we heard the rumors. We know Joseph's not your dad. Or another way, what they're really calling him is, Jesus, you're a bastard. Woe is right. Because that was the common. Isn't he a son of the carpenter? Wink, wink. So Jesus understands that. Being sent to a people, a part of the people. Right? Same way with Moses here. But here's... As that story continues, that if you've ever had to live in two different worlds as a follower of Christ, guess what? Isn't that what Jesus tells us? Boy, he tells us that's what the journey is, that you have to live in two different worlds, knowing that this world is not your home. Right? That you have to live in two separate worlds. That that world is your true home. That this one is not. And he's saying, if you're going to be my follower, you have to keep your eyes in heaven. Right? He goes, knowing that what you experience here isn't for eternity. To keep your focus Running the race like Paul tells us to run. Keep us focused on the prize. Where we're going to be whole. That's the longing that when Moses writes about the garden, Jesus is telling us about heaven. Where God's presence is being done. And we're experiencing it as a fullness. So you have to live in two different worlds. Jesus is preparing you for that. And so you see here, a couple more points I have for you about with Moses and the bigger themes is this. As you're living in two different worlds, have realistic expectations. Okay? So as you're living in two different worlds, have realistic expectations about this one and that one. What I mean by that is this. Very simple. I love Moses' story. Because I, I love if you just watch it as a movie. And how many of you guys like trilogies? 
like trilogies. How many of you would say the third one's way better than the original? Right? Most of us would say they just go down, right, after original, right? Everyone was like, hey, hey, the only a couple trilogies that the second one might have been on par, but most of the time they're like, why do you keep making those movies? They just go down because the original was so good. The original had action for Moses, right? The original was fast-paced. It was amazing. It had all these special effects of all these plagues going down. Can you imagine what that would have been like? Being in Egypt at that time, all of a sudden your drinking water turns red. You're like, what's going on? Why are all these frogs? How many locusts can we have? What is going on? Right? There was so much action going on. And then all of a sudden Moses, let my people go, no. And then all of a sudden we see Passover happen. The last and final plague. To where these people are doing weird things, putting blood on their doorposts. And all of a sudden you're like, why are you doing that? Because our leaders told us to. Because the angel of judgment is going to pass over us. It's going to pass over us. And then you see it. And then you hear it. You hear the cries. And finally, God's people are out of Egypt, literally getting ushered. And they're saying, you guys are a problem. What brought this on? Get out. Moses is like, I've been trying to get them out this whole time. And now they're getting pushed out of Egypt. They're literally giving them treasure. And Moses is going to the Dead Sea. And all of a sudden, we know the story to where Pharaoh is like, I'm mad at them. Get my chariots. Right, and so if there's a time for some music, now it starts. Because you're just kind of strolling along like Fellowship of the Ring, Lord of the Ring. Oh, I'm on for a stroll. And all of a sudden you're like, what? Now you got the enemies behind you. You better pick up that pace. Right? All of a sudden it's like, every man for yourselves. They're going to get the ones in the back first. Right? If you can't run faster than them, you better. Because whoo, because those chariots... Are going to finally get to you. And so all of a sudden, you're running right now. All of a sudden, you're running. And all of a sudden, you come up to a big old dead sea. And you're just like, what's going on? How are we going to get past that? It's like, Moses, what's going on? Moses goes, hey, yeah, God, how are we going to do this? You didn't give me instructions for this. He goes, hey, yeah, take your staff, put that water in it. Put it in the water. All of a sudden, the best special effects you've ever seen. And this is not like Universal Studios going in a tram, right? Have you guys ever experienced that? Universal Studios in a tram, they're like, oh, watch this. <sighs> Little walls like this. They're like, oh, very cool. That's how God did it. No, God didn't do it like that. Boom, walls of water, dry land. You're being chased, right? How many moms are holding their kids going, let's go, how many kids are going, that's cool. <laughs> right? They're just running through that sucker. And all of a sudden, you can see the chariots. They're coming. And then God goes, hey, yeah, Moses, you want to see something cool? He's like, yeah, how do we get it past this? They're still after us. He goes, yeah, just wave your staff over the water. <sighs> and you can just see it. The chariots get spun around. They're just getting on the ocean just like we're saving Private Ryan on Normandy, right? Body on body, wave on wave. They didn't fight that battle. God did. Amazing, right? That is awesome. That's like, yes, Jesus, that's amazing. God, you are powerful. You are just a champion. You are a fighter. All of a sudden, we're like, yes, in there. That's the story, right? That's awesome. Cliffhanger, boom. Can't write anything better. And then all of a sudden, the sequel happens. The sequel happens where, huh, those same people who believed in their God at that moment, all of a sudden don't believe very much. All of a sudden start complaining about, hey, what are we going to eat? Like every parent love that word out of their children's mouth. Hey, what's for dinner? What's for dinner? Uh-huh. And then you tell them, I don't want to eat that. Well, then it looks like you're fasting. You're having a spiritual night tonight. Pray to Jesus. 
He did it for 40 days, you'll be fine. <laughs> right? Right? That's what, what's for dinner? What are we going to eat? All of a sudden, it's like, hey, by the way, you're going to eat on this thing because you're going to be ten- dependent on me daily. Real ex- expectations, and all of a sudden, they grumble. All of a sudden, they start to argue. All of a sudden, they become devices. All of a sudden, they build a golden calf to saying, this guy did it to us, not the Lord of the miracles, but the calf, right? They reject God. They rebel against him. They rebel against the leadership. They grumble. They argue. They fight. Welcome to the church. (laughs) Welcome to God's people. Amen. God's people haven't changed. God's people haven't changed. Amen. Right? God's people haven't changed one bit. The best thing, the theme, like Moses is trying to say, is neither did he. Amen. He stayed with his people. Even when they did stuff, when he told them not to, just like Adam and Eve. Right? And God stayed with those people. And he loved them through the desert. And he sent his son And he redeemed not only his people, but all the people for everyone who will profess faith in him. And I want you to see that theme that Moses started, Jesus finished. Because it's all going to point to Jesus. It's all going to point to do you believe not only in the miracle, but the Lord of miracles. So let me say that again, because the same people that witnessed that awesome special effect were the same people who grumbled. Same people who grumbled. But it's the faith in the Lord of miracles. Because Jesus had the same thing happen to him. Jesus had the same thing happen to him. To where you see it. Just about every scene to when Jesus has a miracle, and there's one that's really beautifully highlighted, to where a friend's come down, they're like, hey, we heard about this guy that has healing power that can make you whole. We're going to take you to him because you haven't walked, and we know he can do something about it. And that place where Jesus is teaching and preaching and healing, they're like, hey, we can't even get in, so we're going to take you to the roof. We're going to take you to the roof. We're like, uh, we know this is up to code, and this is the 30-year warranty, but we're going to avoid that right now, just so you know. So we're going to avoid your warranty as we remove the roof, and we're going to lower this guy right on Jesus to where he has to deal with him. And then Jesus tells everyone who's looking at him, he goes, which is it easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to get up and get up, take your mat, get up and walk? Which is easier? And they put them in a corner because they know if they answer one of those, they'll reveal the other. And when they said, you know what? Only God can forgive. He goes, checkmate, got you. Checkmate, got you. Only God can forgive. So we know which is the hardest. He says, your sins are forgiven. Take up your mat and walk. And he goes, wait a minute. Do I believe him or not? Do I believe him or not? And he did. Can you imagine the faith that it took for him to figure out going, all right, I've gotten up a certain way my whole life. I've gotten up a certain way and things weren't working. And then all of a sudden he gets up and he pulls his knee underneath him. He pulls his knee underneath him. And then he pushes up and his feet and his knees and his ankles work. And he starts to take a couple steps. And Jesus, and he was reminded of Jesus' words, I better take my mat because he told me to get that too. Right? So he goes back for his mat, right? He goes back. He told me to take my mat. I'm not going to leave it here. This is someone else's house. So I better take this. Don't leave it here. And he walks out. People are amazed. 
And other people would say, Jesus, you don't have authority to do that. <laughs> they just witnessed God doing a miraculous work. Just witnessing that stuff doesn't change you. Believing in the Lord of miracles does. Okay? Believing in the Lord of miracles does. And that's what I want us to see about going into this sermon series of Moses. Because you can see really cool stuff. You can hear about really cool stuff. And that's not going to change you one bit. But believing in the Lord of miracles will absolutely revolutionize your life. Amen? Amen. Will absolutely transfer you from one kingdom to the next will absolutely let you experience God's love, unconditional love, when you mess up and when you are just faithful. Because Moses was faithful in a lot of places. Moses was faithful in a lot of places. But you can see that he was also human. And he wasn't perfect. And Jesus was. Because he's always pointing to Jesus. And Jesus, when he revealed himself, Moses went into the palace. Jesus left his entire kingdom and says, oh yeah, by the way, I'm going to show you, I'm going to leave this as an example that you are just going to be here to love your neighbor. Let me, give me that towel. Can you imagine washing people's feet that you knew was going to bail on you when you needed them most? These guys were going to be asleep in a few short hours, and all he needed them to stay awake and pray, and they're like, Jesus, Passover was so good. <sighs> I'm so tired. All of us after Thanksgiving, right? All right? Big old food in our belly. We're ready for a nap. That's what the disciples were, and Jesus is like, stay awake. Pray with me. You don't understand what's happening. And he's led to the cross. But it didn't stay there. Because we celebrate Easter in a couple of weeks and I call that the Christian Super Bowl. And then all of a sudden, Jesus is telling everyone that is finished. Jesus is telling everyone, you are redeemed, you are forgiven. Your sins are no more. And everyone is entrusted with that message that they have freedom and they can be made whole through Christ saying, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just. If you believe him with your heart, you shall be saved. It doesn't just say, as long as you see the movie, you're good. Right? If you just watch it, you're fine. No, he says, if you believe, you're fine. You believe you're good. And that's what Jesus is calling us. The same thing that Moses wrote about. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, again, thank you so much for an opportunity is to just share your word. Lord, we're excited to just witness what you're doing. But Lord, you've asked us more than to just witness what you're doing. Lord, you've asked us to believe and to testify. Lord, we just acknowledge that we need more faith. We need more faith to share our faith. We need more courage. We need more boldness for, Lord, the individual that follows Moses prayed for that. He prayed for courage and prayed for boldness knowing that he was going to be asked to do things Moses didn't which was lead the people into the promised land and they were going to have different obstacles. And so, Lord, we pray that you give us the faith, you give us the courage, you give us the boldness to where Paul essentially tells his readers in Romans that he's not ashamed of the gospel for it has life, for it has healing. And so, Lord, we pray if there's any individual here that hasn't placed their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, we pray they do that today. Lord, if there's any individual here that says, Lord, I just need to rededicate my life to you because there have been other things that I, they put in the middle. Lord, we pray that you minister to that person as well. 
Lord, just like you never abandoned your people when they made mistakes, tell that person today that they haven't been abandoned when they made theirs. For it's by grace that they've been saved. And Lord, just like Paul was able to do and he never let it as be an anchor, all our past sins, Father, are forgiven. And Lord, Paul was a minister of the gospel and he had past sins. Just like every person, just like Moses had a past sin of murder, Lord, and you still used him. Lord, encourage us, inspire us to share the good news of what you're doing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, everyone. I'm Richard, and I want to encourage all of you to participate in communion, and the elements are in the back table if you want to pick one up. Today I have Lois and Venus with me. They're involved in several church activities, including the Friday primetime noon prayer group. As we prepare for communion, let us bow our heads and take a moment to privately acknowledge our sins and ask for forgiveness. Dear Lord, we thank you for bringing us together and inviting us to share communion with you. For it is written in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Eat. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup, is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Drink. The prime time group meets uh, this Friday at noon, and those of you that want to come have lunch and uh, listen to uh, Lynn Edmonds as he leads the group, you're more than welcome. Thank you.
grace. Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hands will be my high guide. Your feet may fail and fear surrounds me. You never fail and you won't start now. And I will call upon your name. above the waves when oceans rise my soul will rest in your embrace for I am yours and you are mine oh, oh, oh. yes you on what Pastor John was just speaking asking for his Holy Spirit to lead us that he has not changed but it's the us that changes correct so as we sing this out can we sing it from the deepest parts of us and asking that his Holy Spirit continue to be that same guide for us in every single season Spirit me where my trust is without borders let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me take me deeper than my feet could ever wander my faith would be made stronger in the presence of my Savior Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith would be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith would be made stronger in the presence of my Savior.
upon your name Keep my eyes above the waves When oceans rise, my soul will press your grin we thank you Lord that you you are ours God just as we are yours Father God may you just anoint us here in this very moment God to be refreshed to be renewed may your Holy Spirit continue to do the good work that you have promised to do may you bring it to completion Father God because we are begging more of you God we are a God seeking church Lord so we're asking you now, Father God, to fill us, God. I pray a blessing upon this church, upon every family represented here, Father God, that you cover them, that you move in their lives, Lord God. Hmm. Make something new of us, Lord Jesus. It's in Jesus' name that we say together, amen. Amen. Um, oh yeah, I forgot. I'm, we're dismissing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, Pastor John, awesome as always, and I hope you guys have a blessed rest of your week. <laughs>